Lieutenant General Jerry D. Harris, U.S. Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Plans and Programs, and Lieutenant General Mark C. Nolan, U.S. Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, Plans, and Requirements. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with us today. The fiscal year 2019 budget request for projection forces continues to modernize and recapitalize critical Air Force weapon systems. I'm pleased to see increasing investments in the B-21 Raider bomber and the high visibility VC-25B presidential aircraft recapitalization effort. Also, this budget proposes funding to continue modernizing the legacy Guard and Reserve C-130H tactical airlift fleet. Throughout the past year, in testimony to Congress, Air Force senior leadership indicated that the Air Force is one of the busiest, smallest, and oldest, and least ready fleets in our history. It is my firm conviction, in light of the threats posed by China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, that we must provide the Air Force the resources it needs to fully support critical recapitalization programs. With regard to bombers, the Air Force outlined its plan for its bomber fleet in the FY19 budget submission. Under this plan, the B-52, the oldest bomber in the fleet, will remain on duty for the next few decades, while the newest B-2 and B-1 bombers will be retired. As I have said, the B-52 is the workhorse of the fleet, and we understand, too, what it's capable of doing, and doing some service life extension on it will make it an aircraft that will take us many years into the future. I'm interested to hear from the witnesses today about factors being used to make the bomber vector decisions in retiring the B-1 and B-2. As for the B-21, I fully support this critical program and am pleased to see that we are moving forward with the project. The B-21 will be needed for projecting power over long distances into denied environments in the future of warfare as it faces us in the era of great power competition. Timely delivery of the B-21 is necessary to ensure our national security. And while I believe that Northrop Grumman is doing a very good job at managing the risk across the entire portfolio, I look forward to assessing in better detail the B-21 program to ensure sufficient progress on both design and construction. With regard to tankers, I'm concerned that continued forecast delays for KC-46A deliveries coupled with the Air Force's plan to begin retiring 47 KC-10A aircraft across the fit-up beginning in FY19 may add unacceptable risk to combatant commanders' ability to execute war plans. In General McDew's testimony to my subcommittee last week, he indicated, we already know the convergence of an aging air refueling fleet with protracted KC-46 production puts the Joint Force's ability to effectively execute war plans at risk. He went on to say it's clear the tanker's fleet and strength will require careful synchronization between KC-10 and KC-135 retirements and KC-46 production and delivery to sustain current force projection capabilities. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this program and how the Air Force intends to manage the transition from KC-10A and KC-135 aircraft to the KC-46A. Furthermore, I look forward to hearing why Air Force believes robust investment into KC-46A is warranted considering continued delays in the program. I'm encouraged with the Air Force's sustained effort to ensure that its mobility aircraft will comply with the FAA-mandated next-gen air traffic management standards by July 1, 2020, with the exception of a few aircraft that will be undergoing depot modifications. But I am becoming increasingly concerned about other military equities that may be impacted as we move to support the FAA mandate. While I support the migration of our tankers and airlift assets to next gen, I do worry about the lack of security protections associated with the bomber and fighter force structures. We need to carefully monitor this transition. While I believe that the Air Force's fiscal year 2019 budget request continues to make up lost ground, I remain concerned about the Air Force's ability to fulfill combatant commander requirements given the shortfalls in strategic airlift, aerial refueling, and the increased risk posed by the complexities of managing the tanker and bomber transitions. In the words of the immortal air power theorist, General Giulio Duhay, in order to assure an adequate national defense, it is necessary and sufficient to be in a position, in case of war, to conquer the command of air. 
Like Duhay, it is my firm conviction that we need a strong Air Force equipped with the most capable aircraft that enable our highly skilled and motivated airmen to defend our great nation. Once again, I want to thank our witnesses for participating in our hearing this afternoon, and I look forward to discussing these important topics. With that, I turn to my good friend and colleague, the ranking member of our subcommittee, Joe Courtney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the witnesses for uh, testifying today at the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee. We are obviously here today on the projection part of our portfolio, and again, we uh, uh, welcome the opportunity to discuss with Air Force leadership the bomber, tanker, and airlift platforms that ensure that we can respond anywhere at any time around the world. The 2019 budget request for these programs reflects the challenging balancing act facing Air Force and the Congress. For instance, the budget continue, uh, continues significant investment in major replacement programs like the B-21 bomber and the KC-46 tanker. At the same time, a large portion of the request also covers a range of modernization efforts aimed at keeping older legacy bombers and tankers operational and relevant for years to come. This is not an easy balance to maintain, and your input today will help our subcommittee evaluate whether we have what we, what we have right in this year's uh, defense bill. With that in mind, I want to quickly highlight a few areas of focus. As I, no I noted earlier, the 2019 budget continues significant and needed investment in the KC-46 tanker replacement. However, I remain concerned about additional delays in this high-priority program. Just last week, the Air Force announced the delivery of the first operational tankers may not occur until next year. I hope our witnesses today will explain how the Air Force is working to address the program's schedule and the impact of delays on the rest of the tanker fleet. Another area of ongoing concern and bipartisan interest in our subcommittee is the modernization of our C-130H fleet. This subcommittee has led the way in moving upgrades like the Avionics Modernization Program, AMP, forward after years of delay, and I appreciate the Air Force's continued support for AMP in the 2019 budget. However, I am disappointed that the budget does not fund other needed upgrades like new high-efficiency propellers and engines for this fleet. I look forward to exploring this issue more in our session today. And lastly, I also hope that our witnesses will provide additional clarity into recent developments on the Air Force One replacement program. There have been very public and high-level pronouncements about a deal to save $1 billion on the new aircraft. Unfortunately, to date, very little detail has been provided to our subcommittee or the American public about this arrangement. At the same time, the Air Force is moving forward on costly sole source contracts to sustain and upgrade the current presidential aircraft. I believe our subcommittee deserves greater insight into what's happening with this program as well as begin uh, our work on this year's defense bill. I have additional remarks, but again, time is the enemy here with uh, votes about to take place, so I'm just going to ask those be submitted uh, for the record. And again, thank you to the witnesses for being here today. We look forward to your uh, testimony and, and questions. Without objection. Dr. Rofer, we'll go to you. I understand that you'll be given the opening statement for the panel, and we turn now to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Whitman and Ranking Member Courtney and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, we want to start by thanking you for the opportunity to be here and, uh, and for your support of the U.S. Air Force, our airmen, and their families. It is much appreciated. Uh, General Harris, General Noland, and I have submitted a joint statement that we would like to be uh, entered into the record, and I will provide a few brief opening remarks so that we can turn our focus to your questions later on. Throughout our 70-year history in the Air Force, we have conceived, acquired, and operationalized some of the world's most high-tech systems. From jet engines, to ICBMs, to stealth, to satellite-guided bombs, to remotely piloted planes, and many things we cannot name, we have made science and technology the whetstone of the world's most lethal Air Force. But despite our current lethality, 27 years of continuous combat operations have done more than just take a toll on airmen and equipment. It has allowed the national security environment to change while our time, talent, and treasure were otherwise engaged. I know the committee is well aware that many capabilities developed decades ago have been studied, copied, and in many cases exploited by adversaries. The new national defense strategy makes it clear we must pick up the gauntlet and modernize the force. We are committed to this task and to doing it cost effectively. I know the subcommittee is also aware of the war fighting and deterrence advantages that unmatched bombers, tankers, and airlift bring to the joint force. This is an awesome portfolio of capabilities, giving commanders global options at the speed of need. Let me give you a few supporting facts. 
Last year, our bombers flew 650 missions in the Indo-Pacific and European theaters, strengthening security and assuring allies and partners during troubling times. We transported and delivered nearly one million personnel, 738 million pounds of warfighting equipment and humanitarian supplies, and over one billion pounds of fuel in flight. The military implication of these numbers speaks for itself. To maintain this advantage, the FY19 budget submission is a balance between readiness and needed modernization. This is no easy task, being ready for today's war while preparing for tomorrow's, but we look forward to sharing steps we are taking. We also applaud your recent efforts to lift the sequestration caps for FY19 and FY18. Stable and timely budgets devoid of continuing resolutions and budget caps are absolutely necessary to build, sustain, and operate the Air Force this country needs and deserves. Thank you again for your continued support of your Air Force, and we look forward to your questions today. Thank you, Dr. Roper. I am going to uh, yield. I'll uh, provide my questions a little bit later. I'll yield to my colleague, Mr. Courtney. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, again, I'll be brief because I know uh, we have a lot of members here. Uh, again, let's just so go back for a second to the uh, C-130H uh, program, which again, this subcommittee over the last two or three NDAs has been very deeply involved in terms of trying to balance uh, all the uh, different stakeholders in terms of that, and, and, and again, on a very bipartisan uh, basis. Again, just for the record, uh, last year, Air Force officials testified that the first part of the avionics modernization program uh, was on track to uh, be in compliance with FAA and international airspace requirements before the 2020 deadline. I was just wondering, for, again, for the record, just confirm that we're still moving forward in terms of uh, uh, achieving that uh, goal. Yes. Thank you. Okay, the second part of AMP was to be focused on longer-term upgrades. And um, again, there's about 400 million uh, in the budget um, to conduct research and development uh, before beginning that procurement. Um, last week, uh, Dr. Roper, you came over and, and testified, um, you know, about the fact that, you know, we, um, as part of acquisition reform, should be using available technology um, and open new opportunities for the Air Force to leverage commercial technology at commercial speed. I mean, I, I'm not sure how much you've had a chance to sort of, you know, dig into this, this program, but it does seem like the AMP2 upgrade in the cockpits is a perfect example of a place where we could maybe accelerate um, that process and probably save some money as opposed to sort of what's in the budget here today. Um, you know, we're talking about um, upgrades that, again, are happening in, um, you know, commercial areas as well as, uh, you know, other parts of the world. And, and I was wondering if you could sort of comment on that. Yeah, of course, Congressman. I, I think what you're seeing in, in the modernization efforts is we've got planes with, with good bones, but it's time to work on the innards, on the networking, on their, the enablers that allow them to be so potent. Um, whenever you're dealing with, with sensing technology or networking technology, you really are playing into commercial technologies that can be a, that can be a, a large contributor. And so uh, I, it's going to be a major role for me in this position to make sure that we are adopting the best of breed from commercial tech, and I think these programs are no exception. I think the general caution, and it's something we're going to have to learn across the Air Force, is how do we use commercial tech safely? We can't put people up in airplanes if there's a cyber vulnerability or something that might be compromised on the battlefield. I don't think that's insurmountable. I don't think it should be cold water on the issue. It's just a different kind of design philosophy to figure out how to use something that, that you didn't control during its whole life. And that's not just going to be part of the airlift or the bomber portfolio. Uh, I think that's going to be across the Air Force, including the space portfolio. So just general lessons to learn, sir. Good. And, you know, as I think we discussed uh, offline earlier, I mean, this subcommittee is very um, willing to embrace, you know, uh, ways to create authorities to uh, promote more efficiencies and, um, you know, safe speed in terms of uh, programs. I think this is one that uh, you really should maybe put on the dance card in terms of, you know, possibilities where you can achieve those goals that you uh, articulated uh, again last week. Um, the last question I have is on KC-46. As I mentioned, um, you know, we're looking at another sort of delay that uh, seems to be sort of causing, being caused by the testing part of the, the pipeline that's there. Um, and uh, I mean, it seems like the production side of it is, is moving along nonetheless. And I, I just wonder if you could sort of comment in terms of how we can, it, whether or not we can sort of get this uh, um, centipede sort of moving along rather than having a sort of bunched up um, you know, at the, after the, the planes are coming out of the factory. 
Yes, sir. I've been uh, spending a lot of time on KC-46, and I, I share your, your concern. This is an important year for the program. And even though it's, uh, it's a fixed-price contract and any of the delays and issues that we see are not things that the taxpayer is paying for, it, we're still taking time away from warfighters if we delay. The, the big thing on any program like this is you got to be out testing. And so the, delay, the delays in getting FAA certifications, uh, the supplemental certification, and then the military certification is a concern to me because having the certifications will allow us to do more aggressive flight testing. And if you've ever done an engineering program, uh, stuff is going to go wrong. That's just the nature of the beast. You, you tackle that by testing early, putting your finger on problems, and being able to retire them. So the fact that there are issues in the program is less concerning to me. What will concern me during this year if issues don't get retired quickly. So it's the speed at which they get retired that's going to be a key metric for me. If you step back from the program, though, there are a lot of requirements that have to be met. I think it's 738. We're about 30 percent through them, roughly, to date. So there's a lot that has to happen this year to deliver on time. Have a great team working it. You asked earlier, uh, what is the government doing to help? We are trying to make every flexibility available uh, so that um, Boeing, which is being a great partner for us, they are committed to the program. We're trying to give them the flexibility to prioritize tasks in the program so that they can tackle the biggest risk as early as possible. So risk burn down driven program. So that's something that we can do on the government side and we are doing. And, uh, and there'll be more to follow on this program. So I expect to, to stay in close connection with this committee on how we're doing. Great. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Courtney. We'll now go to Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a question for the two generals. Um, the Nuclear Posture Review states the necessity of maintaining the nuclear triad, and our bomber fleet remains a key element of that plan. In this year's presidential budget request, the Air Force outlined its plan that calls for the retention of the B-52 and eventual retirement of the B-1 and B-2 bombers. Can you both explain the logic associated with B-1 and B-2 retirement and what factors led the Air Force to the decision to retain the service's oldest bombers, the B-52? Yes, sir. If you don't mind, I'll start with that. So sure. thank you. That's a, a great question. And we, we actually get that one a lot based on the age of the platform. But we based that decision on uh, independent studies and then multiple factors when it came to why we got to the selection of keeping the B-52. Uh, those factors include our maintenance and our sustainment uh, capabilities and the metrics that are associated with those, such as aircraft availability, downtime for maintenance, or downtime for supply. Uh, and the cost in terms of maintenance man hours per flight hour, and the B-52 was, was the leading candidate for the keeping of the current fleet that we have. So as we look forward into B-21 production and deliveries, you'll see a, a phase out between the B-1s and the B-2s to associate us keeping roughly uh, uh, 175 to 170-ish type bombers between the B-21 and the B-52. And yes, if sir. I may add, um, it's a great question. The future of the Air Force is a combination of penetrating, non-penetrating, manned, unmanned, stand off, penetrate, and drop from above. So the combination of the strategy of a B-52 with standoff munitions and its capacity with a B-21 for the future gives us the war fighting punch that we think we will need as we look to the future against China and Russia and the threats that we need to prepare for. Well, let me just follow up on that for a second. I know all of us are reevaluating things in light of changes in what we've seen as the posture by both China and Russia. And I don't want you going to anything that's classified, but was that in part what was driving your decision? It was. That was definitely a part of it. And we allowed the national defense strategy that was recently published to help drive that. I see that, and I appreciate your explanation. That does remove just a source of curiosity for me to understand it. Dr. Rupert, just a, a quick comment to you. It was 10 years ago last month that the tanker project was originally awarded to another company other than Boeing. We have American uh, aircraft that are being refueled by that company's tankers. We're 10 years later, and the tanker we awarded to Boeing can't refuel our tankers yet. So I have concerns that this is going to continue to be a problem, that the assurances we've gotten before about, no, it's going to be this time, no, it's going to be this time, are just going to continue. Relieve me of my concerns, please, sir. 
Congressman, I, I want to start by saying we really appreciate the acquisition reforms that, that this committee and others in Congress have championed. And I think they will go a long way to help get control of acquisition. Um, just to give you a little bit of insight to what running a program would be like in the past, is you would have, you would have the rain, maybe one rain of the horse, and then there would be 100 other people in the Pentagon holding the other. And the idea that you could somehow drive that horse straight to, to destination uh, is, is just really hard to imagine. By giving authority back to the Air Force, you really are able to hold people accountable again. Look at, look at me and say, why is this program not on track? Now, we, I wish we had a time machine that could go back in time and, and fix some of the, the program issues that we've had. And we're going to do our very best to, to, to fix it forward and play the ball as it lies. But I think on the new programs that we're starting to use these authorities on, we're going to see a lot more prototyping, which is a big thing for me. Don't let risk snowball. Go out and start building early. Put your finger on hard to do things. The Air Force has a great history of doing that back during its experimental plane heyday. Built a lot of advanced technology and it had the discipline to only put one new hard thing in each new plane. And if you couldn't do it, then you needed to keep focusing on that thing because that's where your risk was. So I, I think that's, that discipline is going to come back because you've given us the authority to implement it again at scale. Well, I appreciate your comments. I certainly look forward. You can't go back in a time machine. I get that. But you can learn from your past mistakes and make sure you don't replicate them in the future. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. We'll now go to Ms. Bordalio. And after Ms. Bordalio finishes with her line of questioning, we will adjourn for votes and then return. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I only have one question, so I guess I'll meet the deadline. Um, gentlemen, uh, thank you all for being here today, and thank you for your service. We have been told that the current U.S. Transcom requirements for air refueling tankers is 567 aircraft, but the service is only fielding 455 tankers to meet the war fighting requirements. So in lieu of the results of the command's mobility capabilities requirements study, can one of you speak to the service's plan to balance KC-46 production with the retirement of the KC-135s to meet mission requirements? And furthermore, how do you intend to work through the basing requirements for a larger fleet? Yes, ma'am, I'd be happy to, to start with that and see if my colleagues have more to add, so thank you. Uh, we are looking at the study for the KC-46 and what it brings to us, and we've determined that the best platform for us to retire is actually the KC-10, uh, and our, it, you're correct. We do have 455 of the tankers in the fleet now, and our intent is to grow to 479. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that as the KC-46s that Dr. Roper has been talking about add to our fleet, we will stand down KC-10s, but we will actually grow our 135s. So as we replace the 135s initially, they will move to other units and we'll preserve those tankers to actually grow our fleet, adding 25 to, uh, to that capability. When it comes to Transcom and the requirements, we look at this fleet as one of the things that separates us from other service, other countries' air forces and allows us to be that expeditionary force and take the fight to our adversaries. And they're extremely important to what we do, but we're comfortable with the modern level risk once we grow to that 479 with a mix of KC-46As and 135 rs that will have the fleet we need to meet the combatant commander's intent. Okay. Any other? Congresswoman Bordaio, half a day. Half a day. <laughs> um, it's a great question, particularly from Guam. As you know, power projection, our tankers are key towards us. We give 3 million pounds of gas a day right now in the Central Command area of responsibility. The key to it, though, is managing the requirements, working the, the, what we call the schedule, and we've actually made some advancements with that. DIUX created a tanker tool for us that allows us to schedule a little bit more efficiently. And then the other reality, ma'am, is manning those airplanes. You can have all those airplanes, but because of the nature of our fleet, if we were gonna have to use all of those, which they surge to do, but over a sustained period of time, would probably require a would require a partial mobilization to be able to do all of that at one time. Thank you, and half a day to you, too. <laughs> and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Bordalia. We will uh, recess for the votes. I would ask uh, members after the third vote to return back here, and we'll uh, resume the line of questioning.
We're going to reconvene and continue our line of questioning. And we'll go to Mr. Norcross. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm going to follow up on the discussion that two or three other members have already talked about, and that's our tankers. Uh, the original date that we expected the delivery to start when this began, what year? So, uh, Congressman, I'll take that one for the record. I know we're behind, but I want to get you the precise date. Give me a year. We're years behind. Give me a decade. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the many programs where we've been delayed, sir. So, yeah. yes, it is, it is years of time. And I'll get you the precise number for the record, sir. So, you went through a discussion on how we used to embrace change, but at some point you made a decision to go with a program the way it is, no major changes. As I understand it, with the, uh, the new tanker, the boom camera system seems to be top of the issue board. Would you agree to that? Yes, sir. We're having both issues with the centerline drogue as well as the remote visual system, which is what allows the operator to determine if the, if the drogue or the boom is working. If you can't see, then you can't control it properly. So that's correct, sir. When was that spec changed to go from the original camera system? So, sir, the, the requirements, to my knowledge, the requirements have not have not changed. As, as the EMD contract with Boeing was led, it had requirements. There are 738, uh, to my knowledge, that have to be met. They include all aspects of operation, including allowing the operator to be able to see appropriately, allowing the drogue to be employed appropriately. And so it's the, it's the development testing that is proving that some of the choices that have been made in the program are not meeting those requirements. Now, I mentioned a little early in testimony, uh, issues and programs don't give me cons concern per se, most programs have issues. What I'm going to be tracking very carefully as I start this job is how long does it take issues to be retired? If you're designing correctly, if you're doing good engineering, you, you find something, you should be able to fix it quickly because you've designed for it. And so these new issues that have appeared, I'm, I'm tracking them, and what I'm going to be very focused on is how long do they persist. If they persist for a long, uh, for a long time, then that's indicative of a problem with the program, sir. So when they finally come through the delivery date, are you going to have the personnel to fly them, maintain them, and the construction done? And because as I go out to two of the bases, they're not ready for it. Sir, I'll take that one. Um, we are not starting this as a new fleet. So the KC-46, as it comes on, will replace current squadrons. Mm -hmm. So the initial one's going to the trainers <clears throat> once we're done with the testing piece. They will start to work their way through probably a normal contract type of initial training uh, and then start to do the, <coughs> the formal training unit themselves will pick that up and then we will work through it. Because these are all replacements, it'll take us a while, but they will replace squadrons of KC-10s and KC-135s um, and we do have those people on board already. Yes, sir. Trained in the KC-46s? No, sir, they're not trained. That's what I'm saying. When we get the first one to start that training, we will start with our formal training unit, our schoolhouse. Right. They will build up, and then they will become the instructors with a, an assist from the contract team, as it's written. So you've adjusted your scheduling on the construction of the new facilities and the personnel we're, to reflect? I, we're staying on time with those because if the airplanes come to us, we don't want to be late with those facilities. So we're continuing to, to push forward with the MILCON and the people that will be used or put into the effort. Congressman, you're right to point out the, that the delivery of the tankers alone impacts a lot of other things. It impacts training. It also impacts how long we have to keep the KC-10 and the KC-35s uh, flying, right? So there are a lot of coupled um, factors that, that touch that tanker. So it's uh, high priority. And I think for me, if these new deficiencies are not retired quickly, then it's going to make me be very concerned about hitting our delivery date this year. This is a very critical year for the tanker. I agree. I yield back the balance. Thank you, Mr. Norcross. When I go to Mr. Conaway. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the uh, Air Force's 2019-2019 budget call for the retention of B-52s and ultimate retirement, so B-1s, B-2s, once the B-21 is in base. Can you talk to us about uh, the mechanics for uh, how that decision came about in terms of the retirements of the B uh, B-1s and B-2s, and then have basing uh, uh, decisions been made as to where the B-21s are going to be based? Um, sir, I'll start with that if you don't mind. Um, 
The B-52 was selected based on a, a lot of factors uh, and an independent study done within our Air Force A-9 uh, team. And those factors looked at the maintenance and sustainment metrics of the platforms themselves, the aircraft availability, the, um, the maintenance availability versus supply rates, and the B-52 was the winner of that. So that was the selection that when we applied what the airplane can do in the near future when we looked at the B-2, the B-1, and the B-52 as paired with the B-21, and then applied the national defense strategy to this, it was the clear winner for us. So uh, can you talk to us, though, about you, uh, you know, the, the, the basing decisions on uh, the B-21? You're just going to simply replace the B-1s, B-2s with B-21s in place? You're going to move around the world? What are you going to do with them? Yes, sir. Based on the, the strategic capabilities of the bomber, they're all continental-based, so uh, we have them forward deployed, but for temporary status. So I would expect that if you're flying bombers now, a B-1 or a B-2, in the future, you'll probably be- Say out of DICE Air Force Base. B-21s. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and that's where the school is for one of those platforms. Right. We will probably start there, but we're working through the strategic basing decision, um, and we have not released any of those locations. We're just looking at it from those of the airport, the locations currently flying bombers have the facilities to support bombers. All right. Thank you. Go back. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Conaway. Um, I want to get uh, the panelists' perspective on both the new National Defense Study and then some of the comments made by General McDew. If you combine those two together, it appears as though the Air Force is looking to increase its airlift capacity and its tanking capacity over that which you have today, so additional aircraft over which you have today. And I know the mobility capability requirements study is going to come out this fall to look at what the requirement would be into the future and what you need for the entire demand signal that's going to come your way. And looking at where that is, it appears to me as though the place where you will find yourself is increased airlift and tanker force structure that is a larger number of aircraft. So the question then becomes, with the projected numbers of tankers that you'll build and lift capacity that you'll build, it seems like your number, if you completely retire existing aircraft, it seems like your number is gonna be lower rather than higher. So how, how, do, you, how do you reconcile where you end up with total force structure for lift and for tanker based on where the build ends up and completely retiring uh, both KC-10, KC-135 aircraft, as well as transitioning to um, uh, the, both the tactical lift we have in, in C-130s, but also C-17 line is done. You know, we have, we have some demand going on out there. We have some C-5s that are, that are uh, at the boneyard. So the question then becomes, with the demand signal increasing and with the era of great power competition, uh, give us your perspective on, on what appears to be uh, a demand signal for increased lift and tanker force structure. Yes, sir. That's a, a very good question uh, that it will take a couple of us to answer that. I suspect, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll, we'll sure. do that. Uh, let me start with the tankers. We are not retiring all of the KC-135s. When we have the complete fleet of KC-46As, we will have retired all of the KC-10s and some of the 135s. So we'll have a fleet of 300 135s and 179 KC-46s. That gets us to our fleet of 479 as compared to today, 455. Mm -hmm. So that tanker fleet is growing. Okay. To help us with that, we're also reducing the requirements because as we go through and modernize the B-52, the new engines will actually re require a significant, uh, the improvements we're getting out of the new technology will significantly reduce the fuel required for that platform to fly. So while we grow the platforms and the tankers, will also decrease the requirement, which helps us solve some of those issues. Uh, from a bomber perspective, retiring the B-1 and the uh, actually, you didn't talk bombers. You requested uh, strat lift. I'm strat sorry. So yeah. C5s. To help us with our C5 lift, we had uh, initially for budget reasons, we had moved eight C5s into BII status, which means we still had the airplanes flyable on the flight line, but we didn't have the ops maintenance and the money behind them to fly them. We just rotated them through. We are pulling two out last year, two again this year with our FY19 proposal, and we intend to do two each in the next two years. Basically have an additional squadron push back out into the uh, the force to have additional C5s, which is one of our best airlifters. Yes. We'll marry that up with the C17 fleet we have of 222 aircraft, and then a smaller C130 fleet, which should meet our TAC lift. So yeah. 
at this point, when we look at what we're doing with our strategic lift, we are fairly comfortable with where we're headed on the operations plan, but we do have a study that is um, um, the mobility capabilities and requirement study is ongoing, yeah. and we'll address to that if we need to um, when it completes here in several months. Gotcha. Sure, if I may yes. add, you know, as the operat operations, we're always looking at our plans. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely correct, there is always stress on our mobility and our tanker fleet. Yeah. Because as we look at the national defense strategy, everybody wants it quicker and sooner or more rapid. So concepts of operation are super important as we think about how we mix the future force mix. And as uh, General Harris said, modernization reduces some, but then you're still gonna get other people that wanna fill in with other capability. So. Working with Transcom and General Everhart, who's our Air Mobility Command commander, is really looking at this hard because commanding, controlling this, and scheduling it really becomes the secret sauce of how you do it because there's gonna be a lot of friction as you think about the distances that we have to cover in a new national defense strategy. It certainly seems like the demand signal is going to continue to increase, especially based on NDS. Give me this perspective. It, the KC-10As are scheduled, a group of them are scheduled for retirement in FY19. As KC-46A moves to the right, seems like you're going to have a gap there. So tell me what the scheduling happens if KC-46A gets pushed to the right and what the scheduling is for retirement at KC-10s. Sir, we have that study ongoing, but I fully expect the requirements levied on us by the Transcom commander will force us to readdress our retirement schedule. If we're late on delivery, I would expect we would have a similar delay in retirement of the aircraft so that we stay at our men that we have now, but we intend to grow uh, the fleet rather than actually get smaller in that fleet. And in your plan, too, do you address the issue of attrition? We all talk about our fighting platforms in the air and on the sea operating in contested environments. And the days of us being able to go in and gain air superiority in a day or two and then fly unimpeded in that airspace is a thing of the past. So if our lift is going to be operating in contested airspace, if our tankers are going to be operating in contested airspace, being able to put it, be put at risk at long distances. Um, how do you factor for attrition and how do you factor for support for those aircraft? Because again, that's the critical link to be able to fight your way in. So give me that perspective about how the plan considers that. So expect each one of us to bounce through on this question yes, also, please. but um, certainly Chairman. There is risk associated with this. We have BAI or battlefield uh, interdiction or attrition aircraft within each of the squadrons. It's okay. normally about a 10% level, so we have some initially. As you're aware, in our in our boneyard in, in different types of storage, we also have C5s, we have other aircraft that are there. Part of our concern for our strategic lifters, other than what we have in the boneyard, we don't have an open line, and we hear that regularly as a concern. You're not buying any cargo aircraft yeah. right now. Well, to be honest, in a way, we are. The KC-46 is a dual-role aircraft. We intend to use them fully as a tanker, but with the dual-role capability. They do bring to us a, a capability to have strict cargo if necessary, and that is an open line. So that's one of the things that we can look at. And we're also working on the fighter, uh, I'm sorry, the next generation air dominance portion to be able to make sure that we can operate and survive in that contested airspace, as you talked about, mm -hmm. before we bring those aircraft forward to it. Congressman, I think uh, the point about having an, enough aircraft available is extremely important. And as a, as a mathematician coming into this job, the, the number that we so often talk about are the number of aircraft, but the one that concerns me the most are the availability. Yes. So I'm starting to read aircraft availability reports, yeah. and uh, you know it's shocking to see some of the issues that we're having you know, and getting planes up in the air. And so the questions I've been asking as, a, as an acquisition person is where is our investment in research and development to go after sustainment and maintenance where we are spending most of our budget. I think it's an area that we can improve on in the Air Force. We're spending most of our money there. There are many commercial practices that could be applied uh, that we should be applying. Yeah. I brought a, a 3D printed part from a C5 today which, which shuts off a valve on the outside of the plane. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing little efforts like this across the Air Force but I don't see the enterprise effort. And so that's one of the areas that I'm gonna be interested to work with Air Force leadership and go after that part of the aircraft availability uh, equation. Yeah, I think, think that's key. Lieutenant General Nolan? Uh, back to concepts of operation. One of the advantages of the KC-46, our chief says the future battlefield, we need to be networked, mm -hmm. we need to share, 
and we need to learn. Mm -hmm. So as we look at our fleet, some of the capabilities that we'll bring on the KC-46 will enhance the situational awareness of the overall Joint Force Commander, which will then allow us to adjust our concept a little bit so that when we get into that contested environment, we're sharing greater information to improve their survivability mm -hmm. and uh, re the resiliency of our operation. Okay. Yeah, I think, think those are all important points as we look at you know, how we operate in the future in both a strategically challenging environment but also a resource challenged environment to do all that we can there. I think the sustainability idea too and looking at life cycle costs, looking at best value when purchasing, not low price technically acceptable. And as you know, we made a big change last year and how acquisition takes place with that and really minimizing the classes where we use LPTA. Listen, LPTA may be great for buying jet fuel and toilet paper, but for advanced systems and services, probably not the best way to go about it. So I appreciate you all doing that because there's certainly some models out there. The airlines are tremendously effective in sustaining operations and making sure that they don't miss a minute of avoidable flight time because when that aircraft is on the ground, it's not generating revenue. And if we look at it the same way and saying if our, if our aircraft aren't generating sortie capability uh, or mission capability, then we're missing out on what we've invested in. So I think that's, that's the right way to look, to, to look at it. Gentlemen, thank you. We'll now go to Mr. Garamendi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, the testimony thus far. Uh, I want to follow up on some of this uh, KC-10 issues, and specifically, um, this chairman was talking about attrition, and I think he said BAI, which was a new term for me, um, <clears throat> but I think I understand what it is. Uh, the Air Force intends to recapitalize the KC-10 fleet as part of its legacy tanker recapitalization strategy with retirements beginning in 19. Uh, representing Travis Air Force Base, I have a long time interest in this issue. Can you explain what that sentence means? Yes, sir. Um, Congressman, had the KC-46A been delivering on time, we would have retired KC-10s just in time to receive the KC-46s at that base from the selection that's been made. Now that we're seeing the delays in those deliveries, we fully expect to actually slow down our retirement plans. We're, we're going through a study to make sure that it's going to tell us that. But 455 tankers with the throw weight that they can get, number of booms, downrange, along with the number of gas, KC-10 is one of our best airplanes for that. And we intend to make sure that we are not just retiring it, but we're replacing it with KC-46As. Given your testimony, given that it's public, I expect I'm going to get a question from Fairfield, California, has the bed down of the 46 timing changed at all? The timing bed down um, has changed only based on the delivery, sir. So if we don't have the aircraft to bed them down, then yes, it will have changed. But uh, we are still working through the actual timing as it, as it slips. I agree with one thing that with all that you're saying, but obviously concerns about the 46 and its availability or its arrival. The KC-10 is a spectacular airplane. And it seems as though the recapitalization means that this airplane is going to be around somewhere, uh, not in a boneyard, but somewhere probably uh, waiting to be deployed. Is that a strategy that's going to carry forward for the, assuming the 46 comes on, KC-10s go somewhere? No, sir, we do intend to retire the KC-10. We are one of the, there, there's only two other organizations in the world still flying that aircraft, and the parts availability are extremely hard to get, uh, and the operating costs, the maintenance costs are, are not uh, in our best interest. So, Dr. Roper has his additive machine there. So, <clears throat> yes, sir, he does. <laughs> Maybe the only way. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, what is the range of the B-21? Yeah, Congressman, uh, we would be happy to discuss the B-21 with you in a closed session, but for any of its performance characteristics, they're just not things we can discuss in an open hearing. Fair enough. Uh, I probably have other questions, but I'll yield back at this point. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. We'll now go to Mrs. Hartzler. 
Good afternoon, gentlemen. It's good to see you again. Um, as you know, I have the privilege of representing Whiteman Air Force Base, uh, home of the B-2 Stealth Bomber, uh, which is the only bomber with the capability of the A-2 um, AD capability, um, as well as the most flexible leg in our nuclear triad. And the Air Force's FY19 budget proposal eliminated funding for the B-2 Advanced Extremely High Frequency Satellite Communications Program. Uh, which would have provided the B2, B2 two-way high-speed survivable communications during A2AD operations. And while I fully support the recapitalization of the bomber fleet um, with the B21 bomber, the B2 must also continue to be modernized to mitigate capability and capacity gaps in the near to mid-term. So in light of the termination of the B2 AEHF program, what is the Air Force doing to ensure communications with the B-2 remain viable in A-2-AD environments? Ma'am, if you don't mind, I'll start with that. Great question, and clearly uh, you're tied in with your community. Uh, the B-2 is an awesome aircraft that, that is capable of doing that penetration support. This particular radio is still a long way away, and our concern is had we continued funding it the way it was, it would not have delivered until 2026 to 28 time frame with our bomber vector that we're planning to retire just a few years later. Um, in accordance with the national defense strategy that was just published, this is one of the areas that we look to take some risk on communications because we will continue to modify the aircraft to make sure that it has the survivability it needs to, to be fully viable through that period. And we do have survivable radio connectivity using a different system appropriate on that airplane that we didn't think a second one that delivered so late in its lifespan would be the right effect for us. And that was going to be my follow-up question. Can you expound on that a little bit? Um, so you have an alternative secure communication solution to replace that um, to help it go ahead and carry out to the end of its uh, life? Yes, ma'am. This the radio that you're talking about is the um, the secure EHF. That would have been the second one to deliver. The first one we're looking at is an LF VLF system that will deliver before and actually give the capability that we've been missing for a while. So, uh, when we looked at it from a risk perspective, having at least one assured com in there so that we can have the communications required for this in a nuclear role that is survivable in that type of an environment we think will be sufficient for the uh, the lifespan of that aircraft. And when will this uh, LF, VLF be added? So ma'am, will, I will get you a firm date on the fielding date. The first money for it uh, comes in place in our FY19 budget. And just to speak a little more broadly about B2 and the 19 budget, um, it is an important system. It's going to be an important system for us until the B-21 fields. And so the big workhorse in our budget uh, regarding B B-2 is the defense management system, uh, which is a large program, about $1.3 billion over the FIDEP, and it's meant to, meant, to, meant to ensure that the B-2 maintains its ability to go into the most denied spaces in the world and be able to do its power projection mission. So it's not neglected. Uh, we're just focusing on the things that we think are most relevant in the interim period between now and the B-21 fielding. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I, would, I was pleased to see the new start in the FY19 proposal for the radar-aided targeting system, or RATS, software upgrade. What is the timeline for the RATS upgrade, and when can we expect to see it fielded in the B-2? So, ma'am, the RATS uh, has about 43 million uh, in our in our FY19 budget. Um, again, I'll get you the firm date for the record, but I believe it's a it's a two or three year program. But but expect a, a firm date from me on that. It's an important part of the the modernization effort to make sure the B2 uh, maintains its penetration capabilities, communication capabilities, and sensing capabilities in the future. Yeah, very very important aircraft. Uh, very much appreciate your. Uh, acknowledgement of that and, and the steps that you're taking to keep it viable as long as possible because uh, our nation may need it at any point. Uh, General Noland, when you testified before the readiness subcommittee, I asked a question about the bomber vector, and you assured me that the Air Force is working to avoid a bomber dip or capability gap with the fleet. Can you discuss more about the Air Force's decision to re-engine the B-52 and what would happen to the overall bomber fleet if we do not move forward with plans to re-engine the aircraft? 
Ma'am, a fantastic question. The bombers are so important towards our overall concept of operations of how we support the joint fight. The B-52 re-engine is really good news for the Air Force, in my, my opinion. It's going to save us fuel. It's going to give us increased capability with the sense of that extended range that you're going to get by the fuel savings. And it's going to give us more reliability because the engines, as we move, the old engines obviously are hard to maintain. So hopefully it'll reduce our amount of maintenance, will we'll increase our mission capable rate, which will get us more sorties as we move forward. So it's a really positive story, and I think um, Dr. Roper has got a great strategy on how we, we will prototype, and I'll pass it over to Dr. Roper. So uh, Congresswoman, it's the B-52 is a great example of being able to leverage work in commercial industry to help us in the military. Um, the airline industry is booming right now. Uh, engines are a big focus. Fuel efficiency is a big focus in the commercial world. And of course, we want to put back in all of the capability that the current B-52 has. But uh, as, uh, as the general has clearly articulated, there is a chance to do something big on fuel savings, which aren't just saving money for the Air Force. It's operational flexibility. It's extended range. And I'd also like to, to mention, given that we're talking tankers, it's a lot less time on tanking in missions. Right. So benefits across the board. Um, the authorities that Congress has given, has given us uh, gives us a lot more opportunities to prototype things before we commit to the full program of record. I think B-52 re-engineering is a great example of, of, a, of an opportunity to get out, to try something, and to fly before we buy it. And if we're buying it having demonstrated those fuel efficiencies, then we know we're making a smart decision for the future. Sounds great. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Ms. Hartzler. Mr. Garamendi, additional questions? As a follow-up on the B-52, are we developing a new engine or an engine that exists somewhere out there? So, sir, we, we have all options on the table, but my preferred option uh, moving into our acquisition strategy is to leverage commercial. That was a big uh, thrust for me in my, in my previous job. If it's available in commercial industry, it's got their research and development in it, uh, then we should begin by trying to leverage what they have done as opposed to rebuild something ourselves. And where are you in achieving your goal? So, sir, this will be an important year. We're still pre-milestone B in the re-engineering, so this is the year that we should move into a formal acquisition strategy. I'm working with the B-52 re-engineering team, and I expect to have them on their acquisition path uh, within the next quarter of this year. I certainly agree with your goal of using a commercial, commercially available engine, if it's at all possible. Yes, sir. I just consider that just ground rule acquisition practice, that if you can buy it from industry and there's not a national security reason why you can't, then you should. And when will you know? So, sir, the team is going through different engine options as we look through, you know, options for uh, potential source selection. And so there will be more to follow on that, but there's a little more work to do to make sure that we do the right, the right decision and right choice. I asked you a four-letter question. When? So, sir, I will come back. I will take that for the record, but I did my first review with them a few weeks ago, and so I'm expecting them to come back with a recommended acquisition plan uh, within the next few months, but I will get you a specific date. And the approximate cost of re -engine? So, sir, in the FY19 budget, I believe we have $1.56 billion laid in to begin this program. Uh, that is to get it started. I believe over the whole life of the program, it's in the seven or eight billion uh, ballpark. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. Gentlemen, I'd like to explore a couple of other areas. First is the FAA's next gen uh, air traffic management systems and the requirements that it places upon the Air Force. The concern that comes up in my mind is that it is a locational device so that air traffic controllers can determine the place of the aircraft aside from what they get as far as a radar signal. So it divulges our location. So if we're looking at tactical aircraft, whether they're uh, our fighter aircraft or even strategic aircraft like bombers, and having to divulge that location, to me, that creates a situation that's, um, I think, a 
potential problem for the Air Force. So let me ask, is it the Air Force's intention to comply with the next-gen uh, requirements by 2020? And if so, how do you mitigate for what I believe is, a, is an increased vulnerability that's placed on you by now locational information that's now transmitted from the aircraft out? Sir, that is a question right up the A3's alley. So <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah. I have my, um, my vice, my, my senior executive services, is Mr. Wayne Schatz, mm -hmm. and he is meeting with the FAA continually about that. He sits with the FAA on two different boards to talk about this issue. We, like you, have similar concerns. So the answer is we're working a memorandum of, unit of agreement. By the way, thank you for the question and pointing out the GAO report, because I had not seen it. Mm -hmm. So the report said it'd be due in February. It's already March, so I've queried. We're close to getting that, which will work in accommodation between us and the FAA for our tactical airplanes. Our large airplanes, where we can comply, we will absolutely comply to the max extent practical. But we share the same concerns that you, can, you, say, you uh, have. Think about an Operation Noble Eagle mission where you have F-16s that are capping over a city to help protect the president or protect somebody. If somebody could just go on a, and find out where they were, if you know where they are, then you know how to avoid them, right? So. We share your concerns, and we're working with the FAA from a national defense and security strategy. Um, North American Air Command is also involved about this, Department of Homeland Security. So we're, we're all working together towards that accommodation. The other part that we think is super important is their cyber vulnerabilities, and we're working with the, um, the FAA to talk about how we mitigate those and how we ensure that we put a cyber, what I would like to call a defensive counter air bubble of protection around our system so that we don't introduce vulnerabilities into our systems. I would agree. I think there's... <laughs> well, I think it's, I, I think it's a, a both a tactical and strategic question the Air Force has to deal with. I understand the air safety elements of that, but there is a, um, a national defense dimension to our fighter aircraft that we have to keep in mind. It seems like to me the FAA would be willing to uh, provide some type of exception or exemption for those aircraft to make sure that you can maintain uh, that tactical superiority. And, you know, why would you want to provide somebody with a very simple device to pick up a signal that is fairly easy to pick up that's going to be picked up by an air traffic control center to give away aircraft location. I couldn't agree with you more. To me, listen, I understand the air safety element of it, but I also understand, too, there's a much larger mission objective for those fighter aircraft, and hopefully the FAA will be mindful of your greater mission. And listen, I understand their mission of air safety, but your mission is national security, which to me uh, provides, hopefully, them food for thought and what they can do to work with you. Um. Mr. Chairman, I think we have a great relationship with the FAA and the whole interagency. I think this is a really good news story for um, our government because we're working together and they do recognize we have, com we have symbiotic needs here, to be perfectly honest, because what we've also discovered, um, your air data system broadcast is subject to GPS and GPS can be jammed. So you can create problems within that system that they're recognizing also. And then finally, the system is based upon everybody who wants to be part of the system. There's a recognition that you will have non-cooperative people out there who want to do something for a myriad of different reasons. Mm -hmm. And from national defense, from homeland security, from uh, just law enforcement, we need that capability. So we are working together as a team right. to come up with a solution set which meets the timelines. That's great. I think that's important for um everybody to understand, you know, how to prioritize those elements of what your mission is and the FAA's mission. So I appreciate that. I wanted to ask a question about, go back to airlift capacity. As I talked about earlier, we understand from Transcom the demand signal that they see not only now but in the future, the demand from the combatant commanders. We know the C-17 line is done so we're not going to build any more of those aircraft unless we retool and ramp back up, which is not likely. But we do have 25 C-5s, as I said, in the boneyard. Um, 
would it make sense to bring those aircraft back? To me, having those 25 aircraft back into operation provides a tremendous amount of, of lift capability in our air platforms. And of course, we're talking about the sea lift side too, but specifically to you all, we're looking at the full suite of lift and it seems like those C fives, those 25 sitting in the boneyard is maybe an opportunity. So, so Chairman, uh, that, that's a great question. Continuing on that line of thought, uh, on our past studies, when we looked at this based before we had our national defense strategy that aligned to us to a new, uh, new effort and structure, uh, we did not need those. We were comfortable with holding those where they're at so that we need, if we needed them, we would have access mm -hmm. to them. Uh, as the ongoing mobility capabilities and requirements study completes, we will use that to inform with the national defense strategy and the plans that we've been set in front of us with the strategic alignment of our high-end capacity against our peer adversaries first. If that drives us to say we need to have additional airlift, that's one of those places we can go, or do we need to then uh, work with our team and actually open up a new strategic lift line? That'll be part of that study. Yeah, I think it's critical. As you look at the needs identified in our O plans, and in talking with General Dunford about executing those O plans, wherever they may be, but especially in areas that are at distance, uh, to be able to sustain those operations, the key is lift. And as you know, the, the, you know, the, first, the first two to three weeks, uh, you know, we surge a lot there, we can do that. But the key is, is sustaining those operations and the limiting factor that it elongates the time frame for us to fully execute those O plans the single logistical roadblock to that is lift, being able to get supplies and folks to the fight. And especially at distance, that becomes a bigger and bigger issue. So I think, you know, as we look at the NDS, and I do agree that we are in the, in the age of great power competition, you know, having that capability is, is going to be key. So I appreciate you all looking at that and really seriously studying, you know, what we can do with those particular aircraft. Mr. Garamendi. Very useful line of questioning. Those 25 C-5s that are in the boneyard, what does it take and how long does it take to bring them back up? That's a great question. Uh, it's different for each. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, <laughs> each aircraft in, uh, we have different types of storage. So type 1000 is our, our most restrictive storage, fastest to return to fly. Um, and aircraft in there, we can generally turn them in a couple of months, but it's one or two at a time. Our team that does that is not sufficient in size to have that effort based on what we're doing in day-to-day -day operations, their care caretaker status. If we run into an attrition event, we would be able to put more manpower after that to, to turn those quicker. But some of these larger airplanes, depending on if they're in type 2000 or type 4000, different, different types of storage, whether we've been able to pull parts off them or not, they take up to three years to get them out of that storage and build, which is why the study's looking at that to say, is it better to pull them out based on the storage level that they're at, or is it better to go after new equipment? Um, and we also haven't talked about our Civil Reserve Air Fleet. That is another option for us, that if we have a peer type of a competition, uh, there's probably not a whole lot of civil aviation going on at the time in that area, and that may free up big portions of our fleet to, to activate them. <laughs> yes, sir. General Harris, another thing to consider, too, you know, we all look at CREF as, as that, that flex or that surge capability, but as I said, the thing that concerns me in looking at that, and listen, those carriers are key, and I think they can perform a lot of duties, but there's a particular mission set that strategic lift aircraft can perform that those commercial carriers cannot. And that's operating that contested airspace and being able to do that and having systems on board to sense to, to at least counter what may be a threat to that particular aircraft. So I, I would think within that realm too, and hopefully the study will reflect upon that and understand, you know, if we're gonna be executing a no plan in a contested area of the world, especially against one of our adversaries today that's, that's May, may near a peer or may, may, may be one that wants to be near a peer that, that acts badly, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be in a pretty challenging situation. So I hope that, that, sh that you all reflect upon that. And like I said, our craft carriers do a great job and there's a role for them, but also for our strategic lift and uh, there's a time element in that too. So anyway, we're, we look forward to working with you and 
just as Ranking Member Courtney said, if there are things that we can do in this year's NDAA as far as authorization, as far as um, direction that you feel that you need with this, please let us know because we think this is one of those critical tipping point times where we are now devoting the resources to recapitalizing our Air Force, our Navy, our Marine Corps, and our Army. Getting this right is the key. And I'll emphasize again that it is an extraordinarily competitive environment to compete for resources up here to put into the defense budget. So by every measure, we have to make sure that these programs, which are complex programs, KC-46A, B-21, F-35, these have to be delivered on budget and on time. Because if we hiccup with these things, folks up here are going to say, see, I told you. You know, we put money there. They couldn't properly put it in place. They couldn't manage the dollars. And then we're back in this scenario where the Congress's response is what? To either reduce funding, so say build fewer. And we all know what happens when you build fewer. What happens to unit costs? They go up. We saw that with F-22. Or what happens, too, is we say, well, we have a limited number of resources, so build them slower. What happens to economies of scale when you build them slower? Unit costs go up. So we've got a delta that we have to meet, and I know that you all are focused to do this, a delta we have to meet on capacity as well as capability. The capability is within the aircraft. The capacity is the number that we build. The only way that we get there is to make sure that these programs are successful on budget, on time. And if there are things that we need to do to enable or things that we need to do to make sure that we're helping, let us know. Another thing that we're responsible for is making sure that we are watching the watchers. So that is to make sure that we are, we are laser focused on things that are happening with this program, both within the Air Force. And I want to give you all credit. The management part of that has gone, I think, very well on some pretty complex systems. But also making sure we place the attention on the primes and the subs in all these programs, because everybody has to perform. And I'll go back to this. Um, there are three elements of a successful program. Getting the requirements right and making sure the requirements are stable. I think with all these platforms, they are. And, and stability and certainty and funding, that's our job. No more CRs. Let's, let's get, get, get the job done here so you'll have certainty. And then industry has to execute. Any weakness in those three create the hiccups in programs, and then we don't have what we need. So this is a team effort, and we look forward to working with you, and thank you for taking the time to come in today. Mr. Gearman, any, any other questions? Very good. Gentlemen, thanks again. We are adjourned. <laughs>